Heidi Ho, welcome to today's episode of the John Campus Show podcast. Today we're going to be talking about a little bit about Monkey Man is now in theaters. I went to go see it. What were my thoughts? Also, the brand new Game of Thrones series that is coming called, what's it called again? A uh, Night of the Seven Edge Kingdoms yeah. is uh, on its way. Uh, Margot Robbie and Olivia Wilde are teaming up to do an Evangeline movie that was created by the Deadpool creator. Uh, Dwayne Johnson has revealed that that live-action Moana film is happening, and they're shooting it later this year. Dune 3 is now official. It is coming. Legendary has tapped Denis Villeneuve to return again. We're going to discuss that. And a brand-new Fantastic Four poster that got dropped by Marvel kind of suggests that this movie is not at least starting in our MCU. Uh, that and a few things more. The John Campus Show podcast starts right now. Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the best damn movie related show on the planet Earth, the John Campus Show podcast, coming to you from right here in our quaint little studio, brought to you in part by our friends at Mint Mobile. I'm, of course, your host, John Campia, and it is an awesome honor and privilege, as it is every day to have you our international friends gather around as we talk about our favorite things in the world. Movies and movie news, TV and streaming, and all sorts of good stuff. Not just giving you our opinions, but giving you information and context so you guys can form your own well-informed opinions, whether they're the same or different than ours. Uh, joining me in studio, we got Ray Ora. Hey, what's up, everyone? We got Jonathan Voico. Hello. Writer, director, producer, Robert Meyer Burnett is I, here. I bow to Shalabal, Empress of Zen La. And, of course, most importantly... You guys are here. Thank you so much for being here, making today's show part of your day. And here's how it's going to go. We're going to start off by talking about those predetermined topics and a few others. And then in the second part of the show, we're going to take your live questions. So if you guys have a thought, theory, opinion, question for the show, go ahead and use the Super Chat feature and fire that in. And as long as it's appropriate for us to address on the show, we'll address it in the second part of the show. All right. That down, guys. Let's get started off with this, shall we? I went to go see Monkey Man uh, yesterday. Now, you guys know if you've watched our show regularly, that trailer for Monkey Man came out of nowhere and smacked us all across the face. It is an awesome trailer. And I have been waiting for years for Dev Patel to truly get his spotlight. You know, I, I just, I love this guy. I think he's been great in everything that he's been in. How good was he in The Green Knight? Great. How good was he in The Green Knight, right? So this kind of looked like a John Wick in India. And if that's what it was, I'm good with it. So the action looked incredible. It looked like a great vengeance story. So I went to go see it yesterday, and here's my overall thoughts on it. I didn't love it. I liked it. I think it's a great first directorial effort from Dev Patel. And Dev Patel's performance is stupid good. Both from the enraged, wronged man on a fire trail of vengeance, but also in action. The way he pulled off the action was breathtaking and wonderful. There are two main problems with the film, all right, that keep it from keep it just being a movie that I that I liked from being a movie that I loved. Here are the two main problems with it. Number one, as will sometimes happen with a first-time director, the flow of the film feels pretty choppy. Like, it doesn't have a good natural flow. And, you know, Dev Patel tells the story, you guys can tell from the trailers that some of the story is told from when he's a little boy and some is said in modern time. So he's jumping back and forth to tell the story a bit from when he was a little boy to where he is now. And it and that can work great, but in this case, it didn't really flow very well. So I, I was constantly feeling kind of jarred. It was a little bit jarring as the movie was going on. The second thing was this. When this movie is about a personal vengeance quest, it's awesome. And, you know, a lot of people say it's like a John Wick. But my buddy called me this morning who had also seen it. He says, you know what? It's not so much like John Wick as it is like... Um, Kill Bill. Mm. I'm like, oh, no, no, he's exactly right. This movie really is more like Kill Bill. And by the way, there's a pretty good John Wick reference in the movie, too. Um, it's more like Kill Bill. And when the movie is that, fires on all cylinders, it hums along, 
It's great. It's visceral. The problem is, and they hint at this in the trailers, so I shouldn't have been surprised, but the problem is it goes beyond just being a personal vengeance story. There's that. But then they have to make it so his personal vengeance story has implications that can save his country. And, you know, so there's more like internal India politics and and stuff like that. And I found that whenever they were doing that kind of part of the story, it lost momentum. It felt like we are going to take a break from this story that you're really getting into. And we're going to tell a little bit about this part of the story. And on that level, it kind of fell off the tracks a little bit. And then once they got back to personal vengeance, boom, it started flying again. So overall for me, nice first directorial effort from Dev Patel. His performance is incredible. The action, there's a decent amount of action, not as much as I thought there would be, but a decent amount of action. And when there is action, mind-blowingly good. And the personal vengeance story part of it was great. On the negative side, again, a little jarring and choppy, not a very good narrative flow. And when they got away from the personal vengeance story and tried to do grander scale things, it didn't quite work as well. So overall, it's a movie I like. I recommend people seeing it. It just isn't, I was kind of hoping it'd be one of my top 10 films of the year. Uh, And I don't think it's going to be it for me. But anyway, guys, uh, my question is for you. What do you think about it? I liked the film. Uh, Did you see it? Did you like it as much as me? Did you like it more than me? Maybe you didn't like the film. Whatever you guys think, jump down to the comment section below and leave your thoughts there. All right, guys. With that down, let's move on to this, shall we? So Game of Thrones uh, has one spinoff slash prequel series out, House of the Dragon, and it's absolutely fantastic. Well, now we've got another one coming. We've heard about it. But they just made their first major moves. As Deadline is reporting, the Game of Thrones spinoff, A Knight of the Seven Kingdoms, has now cast their two leads in Peter Claffey and Dexter Saul Ansel. I hope I'm saying their names right. In the lead roles. Here's a good look at the two leads for the new film. And it describes this. A Knight of the Seven Kingdoms, The Hedge Knight, HBO's Game of Thrones spinoff, has cast its two leads. The series has cast Peter Caffley and Dexter Soul Ansel in the lead roles of Dunk and Egg, which kind of sounds like a couple of characters that Kevin wrote for uh, for Star Wars. Um, then it goes on to say this. Set a century before the events of Game of Thrones, so before Game of Thrones, after House of the Dragon, It follows two unlikely heroes who wandered Westeros, a young, naive, but courageous knight, Sir Duncan the Tall, and his diminutive squire, Egg, set in an age when the Targaryen line still holds the Iron Throne and the memory of the last dragon has not yet passed from living memory. Great destinies, powerful foes, and dangerous exploits all await these improbable and incomparable friends. All right. I'm going to tell you what I really like about the sounds of this. First of all, I'm more excited about it because House of the Dragon has worked so well. So clearly they can spin off Game of Thrones and do a good job. But here's what I really like about this and why why I'm looking forward to, to this is that description. When you look at both Game of Thrones, the main series, and House of the Dragon, everything is about the Iron Throne. Everything is about control of Westeros. Everything is about who's in power, right? It's grand, global scale storytelling. I love the idea of telling the story of the world of Westeros from the perspective of two people who are not vying for the throne, of just two people who inhabit and live in that world. And I think there's something very interesting. Now that we've had two shows that are on the grander scale, it'd be really cool to see a story told from that perspective. So I got to say, Rob, I'm not going to say I'm jumping up and down with excitement, but it's really got my interest. What do you think about the sounds of this? I think it's fantastic. I mean, a story about a knight and a squire, you know, like you said, it's it's a totally different vibe. It's a totally different thing. And I think one of, one of the really interesting things is I think they're doing with the Game of Thrones, call it a franchise, call it an IP now, they're doing what they should be doing, where you're taking this world and there's 100 million stories you can tell within the world and you don't always have to deal with the machinations at the top of that world. And what is it What is it like to be an errant knight? You know, maybe a knight without a, a house or something. We don't know. Uh, I mean, some somebody does because I'm sure it's been described, but I don't know what the story is. And it, 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 to me, it's immediately appealing, this kind of a story. I mean, I've been reading stories about knights and their squires my whole life. <laughs> so bring this on um, 
Well, there you go. I mean, I I'm totally interested in this. Uh, it it I love it. I love it. Becomes a personal story of two friends. Uh, uh, I, I, it sounds great. And I guess the tale itself is written by George R. R. Martin. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, it's all. So, it, it takes place uh, 72 years after House of the Dragon. Okay, um, so right there, pretty much smack in the middle. But a hundred years series. before Game of Thrones. Yeah. So I, it looked like there's a a graphic novel of it. Is out? Uh, well, they're novels, and then yeah. I they're thought like I thought stories. I saw one of those images said it was they had it in a in a graphic novel. Yeah, yeah they too. converted them. If to they graphic. do, I might have to go grab that yeah. thing. Hey guys, question is for you. What do you think? I love the sounds of this. I think this could be really interesting. Maybe your Game of Thrones out. Uh, whatever you guys think, jump down to the comments section below and let us know your thoughts. All right, guys. With that down, let's move on to this, shall we? Uh, two of the hottest names in Hollywood over the past couple of years have been that of Olivia Wilde because her she her directorial debut with Booksmart was so good. So good. Now, the, the one she did with Florence Pugh... Uh, what don't was Worry it? Darling. Don't Worry Darling. I know a, a lot of people really loved that film. I was iffy on it, to be honest with you. But you know what? It was an interesting effort. Very interesting film. Really, really well crafted. Fences. Absolutely, 100%. I, again, I didn't love the film, but whatever. And then, of course, Margot Robbie, who just had the number one biggest film of 2023, had a bunch of Oscar attention, all that kind of stuff with Barbie. Well, apparently, the two of them are teaming up to bring us a comic book adaptation of Evangeline. No, not Evangeline. Evangeline. Uh, this comes to us from the folks over at Variety who wrote the following. Olivia Wilde, Margot Robbie, and X-Men producer Simon Kimberg, we like him, are joining forces for a feature adaptation of Evangeline, a comic book character from Deadpool co-creator Rob Liefeld. Wilde, whose filmmaking credits include Booksmart and Don't Worry Darling, is attached to direct. Robbie's company Lucky Chap and her partners Tommy Ackerley and Josie McNamara are producing. Kimberg, the writer and producer of X-Men tentpole films, will also produce the film. Okay, so no word yet on whether Margot Robbie will actually be in this. This is kind of feels the same as when they first announced Barbie because they first announced that, okay, she's going to be uh, producing the film. They had uh, Greta signed on to direct, but there wasn't any word about whether she was actually going to play Barbie or not for a while. I don't know if she'll jump on board of this and actually play the lead character or not. I really like the idea that Kimberg's involved in this because obviously that he brings a lot of, experience working in the comic book genres and stuff like that as long as he's not directing uh that could be a good thing anyway rob do you know much about evangeline and uh, what do you think about these two teaming up to make a film like this what do you think well i mean it's not a very well-known character i'm a huge fan of rob liefeld he does another show called rob observations you know <laughs> so we're both the rob observations dudes i mean the water's warm jump on in but um the we had him on our show a couple of times when we were still back in the AMC yeah he came on like that. Yeah. heroes he's a great guy he, he one of the most fun times i ever had at comic-con was when he told me the story of building a one-to-one -one scale young blood spaceship and bringing it to comic-con <laughs> for 1994 it's crazy he's the best um but i don't you know i don't i have not read a lot of these comics you know i i i'm sure it came out of his his image days or or later but um, you know, it, on one hand, I'm excited. On the other hand, because I'd love to see him get the uh, this kind of movie success. But on the other hand, it's like unknown comic characters, unless the movies are really great, like, say, The Crow, you wind up with a bloodshot, which doesn't do as well. You know, they were going to hopefully launch a valiant universe of films. From of course, the, the movie being terrible didn't help. Yeah, that's the problem. <laughs> but here's the thing. Coming off of Barbie... I mean, it's interesting that she's using her clout that she gained with Barbie, and Olivia Wilde is obviously, I think, a first-class filmmaker, and you've got the girl power vibe. This is what they're going to do. I think it's I probably be pretty good. There's a re And Simon Kinberg is no slouch when it comes to, I mean, yeah, okay, he directed right. Dark But he's not Phoenix. directing this. He's right, directing and, this. and and I, I, I get it. I understand where people are coming from. I know, but still, he's produced some good movies. Uh, this is an interesting team. I think uh, it's something I'll keep my eye out for. I'm excited. I hope it's good. All right, guys, question is for you. What do you think? You got some powerhouses here teaming up to bring uh, a little-known character, but an interesting-sounding character to the screen. You excited about this? Doesn't move the needle for you at all? Whatever you guys think, jump into the comments section below and let us know your thoughts there. All right, guys, that down. Let's move on to this. You're welcome. So Moana 
It's <laughs> kind of the year of Moana, right? They've Just the other day, we talked about the first official image released from Moana 2, the animated sequel, Moana 2. But lest we forget, they have announced recently that they are going to do a live-action remake of Moana. And Dwayne The Rock Johnson himself is going to be appearing in it as Maui, by the way. I, I don't care what anybody thinks. I freaking love this movie. I love Moana so much. I love the character of Moana. I love the character of Maui. I love the songs in it. I just think this is just a fabulous film. And didn't it, wasn't it like the number one streamed movie? Yeah. In all of streaming in yep. 2023? Like uh, above everything else? So you're not the only one. So I cl clearly I'm not the only one. Completely love this movie. Well, one of the things we didn't know about is, well, they're busy getting Moana 2 done. So will this live action Moana thing ever happen? When are they going to get it going if it is? Well, Dwayne The Rock Johnson was asked on his social media by a viewer when that's happening, and he answered. This is what got said. One of the viewers asked, yo, is Moana going to be a sequel or a live-action remake? To which The Rock replied, both. Moana animated sequel comes out this holiday season, and this is the key part. We'll film the live Moana this year. Now, I got to tell you. That's kind of surprising to me. I mean, it's exciting to me, but it's surprising to me. I really thought they would, I don't know why. I'm sure the team that's making the animated one is completely different from the team that's making the live action one. But I kind of thought they would get through doing the Moana sequel, get it out, have it do its theatrical run, and then look at going into production maybe sometime in late 2025 on the live action Moana, if it ever actually happened. But apparently this thing is moving a lot faster than I thought. But there's still a question out there, Rob, about, do people even want a live action Moana, right? Because Disney has had, to be fair, some mixed results when it comes to their live action adaptations, right? On the one hand, you got movies like Aladdin that made over a billion dollars. You had the Lion King uh, CGI one that became the highest grossing animated film of all time with over a billion dollars. They also had Beauty and the Beast, which I think did pretty well at the box yeah. office too. But but you know not, not Cinderella wasn't great. Our beloved I Cinderella. Oh my God, did Kenneth Branagh so Lily James. Cinderella. so good. But they also did Maleficent and Maleficent Two, and and a couple of others. So I think it's fair to say that Disney, when it comes to the live action remakes, is and I think it's fair to say it's hit and miss. Hit Some and can miss. be great and be huge successes. Some not so much. Fair enough. Do people want a live action Moana? I don't speak for everybody, but I'll say sign me up. I'd be really curious to see how do you take this world? Oh, I love that image. Yeah. <laughs> couple, I have a couple like mock ups. Yeah. That's that's a little, you know what? That's a cross of Ray. And I think Ray knows what I'm going to say. That is a cross of Dwayne The Rock Johnson. And who is the Pittsburgh Steeler linebacker? Oh, yeah. Troy oh, Polamalu. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's a cross between him and Troy Polamalu. Uh, but like if that's what Maui looks like in the live action, Sign me up. I'm really curious to see how they'll do this. The key thing, though, is who's going to play Moana? Right. Because while the original voice actress is coming back to do the animated sequel, she's she can't play Moana. She's like she's too old at this point to play. Even an, a little bit aged up Moana, as we see in this picture, she's been aged up from the original film. She can't do it. So who they're going to get to play her? That's going to be key. Anyway, Rob. What what are you where are your thoughts right now about whether they should even be making a live action Moana about the fact that it's actually shooting this year? Does that surprise you? What do you think? Who wouldn't want to see this? I mean, Dwayne DeRock Johnson coming back playing uh, Maui, you know, for in real life. By the way, just just time out. A couple of our viewers in the live chat, including South London reseller, saying Zendaya as Moana. Is she too old? She, listen, I she can, I don't know how old she is. To me, she can still pass for a high schooler. And when you look at the new picture of Moana about what she, because they've aged her up a bit. You look, I don't, and she can sing. Like yeah. Zendaya, okay, sorry. I I got sidetracked, but that, that casting Look, I mean, kind of those along the lines. I mean, I, I would have thought Zendaya, you know, as a 16 year old might be, but if they're aging her up. But if she's like 21 or something. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's definitely something they could you do. You have a hard look, time finding it, a better singer. You put Zendaya and you put, Dwayne Johnson as Maui in a live action movie. That's a that's you're you're on the Aladdin side of things there. You're on the billion dollar side of things. And I think look, who wouldn't you just look at that picture of Dwayne Johnson. I mean, I'm an old man. Should I get excited about a Disney live action remake? 
Yes. I mean, the answer is yes, I should, you know, and, and it's, it's, why wouldn't you like that? Because he would make that movie so much fun. It'd be great. Oh yeah. Yeah. He'll have a black. Cause I, I mean, his vocal performance in the first one was just fantastic. So I don't know. We'll see how it goes. Guys. Question is for you. What do you think about this? Are you looking forward to, and I would understand if you're not, but are you looking forward to a live action Moana with a live action Dwayne Johnson as a live action Maui? What do you think about the fact that they're moving pretty quick on this? They're going to shoot it this year. Whatever you guys think, jump on down to the comments and let us know your thoughts. All right. With that down, let's move on to this. Dune 2 is still in theaters. Is it officially Dune 2 or Dune Part 2? It's Dune Part 2. Part 2. Whatever. I'm still going to call it Dune 2. Like The Godfather. Ah. So Dune Part 2 uh, is still in theaters. Uh, it's already crossed the $600 million mark. Uh, we'll see how close it gets to $700 million. To me, probably the best movie I've seen in the last decade. I, I, I'm Not everybody agrees with that. That's cool. I'm just saying for me personally, probably the best film I've seen in a decade. I absolutely adore this film. But I've been a little bit worried about if they do a Dune 3. Because if they do Dune 3 and they base it on Dune Messiah, I have I have some concerns. I hope they call it Dune Messiah. Uh, I kind of hope they don't. So I want them to so bad. I, and there are a lot That's of, the book. You're not alone. You're, a lot of people do because that is the name of the book. At any rate, though, take any of the doubts out. It's now official. It's happening. Dune 3 is a go, and Legendary has signed up Denis Villeneuve to return to the world of Arrakis. This comes to us from the folks over at The Verge who wrote the following. Variety reports that following the massive box office success of Dune Part 2, Legendary has tapped Denis Villeneuve for a third installment that would presumably continue the story of how Paul Atreides goes on to conquer the galaxy. Earlier this year, Villeneuve told Empire that he had already put words on paper thinking about where he would like to take the Dune franchise going forward. Now, they've got another film they're doing with him after that because it goes on to say this. Legendary is yet to announce any sort of timeline for when the production of Dune 3 might begin, but the studio intends for the movie to debut before its next project with Denis Villeneuve, an adaptation of Nuclear War, a scenario. Annie Jacobson's 2024 Pulitzer Prize nominated nonfiction book about how nuclear war scenarios would likely play out. So they've already got this movie lined up with Denis. This nuclear war movie, which, by the way, how disturbing is that movie going to be? So they've already got this movie lined up, but they're saying we want to do Dune 3 first. Okay, I have questions. First thing to me is, well, then how quickly you're going to get moving on Dune 3? Hopefully you get moving more quickly on it than how fast they got moving on Dune 2. So that's one thing I'm hoping. Hoping. So it's it's probably going to be sooner rather than later if they've already got another film they want to do with them, but they got to get this one done first. The next question I have, is he going to take a lot of liberties with the Dune Messiah story? I certainly hope so. Because, Rob, out of the 23 Dune books? Well, there's only six Frank Herbert Dune books. Right, but they're overall, they're like 20 There's a lot, odd but I don't consider those. In the canon. thing. I've only read two. I've read Dune, and I've read Dune Messiah. Dune Messiah, to me, is not nearly as good as Dune. <laughs> Actually, it's different. It's very different. And as you go on in the books, they decline in quality and they get more and more psychedelic. Like yes. They get more and more. They get real weird. Wacky. Although God Emperor is a banger. The God Emperor of Dune with like the uh, 5,000 year old Paul Atreides son who's half man, half woman. Leto the second. Yeah. It's good um, stuff. Yeah. Wild, wild, wild stuff, as Johnny Carson <laughs> would used to say. Yeah. Wild stuff. People are like wild Johnny stuff. who? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Johnny. Yeah. Johnny what? Who's Johnny Carson? So. But, so here's my concern, and, and I, I really think there's a lot of very fan-unfriendly things that happen in Dune Messiah that I don't know that the audience is going to be there for. That's a woeful understatement. Is that yeah. a huge understatement? <laughs> but at the same time, like, that's the whole purpose of the story. Yeah, it is. Going. So it is. To then yes. suddenly be like, none of this happened, only good things happen is like... Mm. But, you know, we saw how many liberties Denis took with the first two Dune films. So my kind of hope is that by signing up to do the third one and that he's already put some ideas down, I'm hoping, honestly, and I know this is an unpopular thing to say, and I wouldn't normally say this about franchises, I kind of hope he just makes up his own third movie. I, oh, I no, really no. kind of do because I I don't know that I want Dune Messiah to I don't exist. know, John. It could be the feel-good romance of 2026. 
<laughs> that no no was like a parent telling his kid not to touch a hot stove. Yeah. yeah. I'm I like just, Oh, I don't know. Sixty one but... billion people dead. <laughs> but now Rob, you are far more acclimated with all the Herbert versions of the novels and stuff like that. Number one, what do you think about Denis signing up? It's now official. He'll be the one to do Dune three. How close to Dune Messiah do you think he'll make it, or do you think he'll go in his own directions, or will he make it a, a mixture of both? And how quickly do you think we could actually see Dune 3 this time? Well, you know, it's interesting because when I first heard this project happening in the first place, it was told to me that the movie was going to be Dune, Dune Prophet, and Dune Messiah, and they were going to do th a trilogy. That's how it was pitched. When I first heard this, I'm like, that's interesting, the Dune Evil movie. I think I heard about this one. Arrival was being made. I'm like, are they really going to do that? But they, it looks like they, they are. So, and obviously, Dune Messiah, the end of it's, it's not the entire end of Paul Atreides' story, but the end of Paul Atreides' story in that iteration. So, I do think that's going to be, it is going to wind up the story of this revolution. What what has begun in Dune Part One and Dune Part Two, and finally, people will shut up about their white savior myth. This is just another white. No, it's not. <laughs> it doesn't end that way at all um if please read the books they're there it's not a spoiler but um i think they might make some changes like i really prefer what he's done with uh chani at the end you know how how she left i did too i preferred what he did with chani at the end which is a big departure from the book yeah i prefer how he handled paul's sister at the end which is a huge departure yeah, from the book but it makes i mean i think that's what a good adaptation is and you know the, there's that great line when when right now when when jessica says at the end in the book she says to Chani, you know right now they call us concubines but history will call us wives mm. and that's how the book ends which i thought was really interesting i love that ending but i also think that in doing an adaptation i don't having uh zendaya's character be a syncophonic supporter of paul atreides i don't think would play today I think that was a really good choice in making an adaptation. You show that she's a strong woman. That's why Paul is attracted to her in the first place. And and you keep her a strong woman. If she was just going to be like, oh, Paul, I love you. Take over the galaxy. It wouldn't work as That's my wife, by the way. Uh, so <laughs> It wouldn't work as well. I, I, I like me. what they've done. And people, get all, <laughs> people get all upset. No, I think that moving forward, the fact that there's that frisson between the two of them. And the same thing was true of adding the fundamentalist sect of the Fremen in the movie as well. That, that Paul had to go make that great speech and convince yeah. that the Fremen were not all of a piece because we certainly on this planet, no one believes the same thing. You go to a different country and there's people with different beliefs and different levels of things and it made it more realistic and I like that. So I think he will make, he will make changes in the story, John, but it ain't going to be something like the notebook where yeah. it's the great romance of your time. <laughs> not going to be like that. Yeah, it's uh, it definitely not. So uh, we'll see. Question is for you guys. What do you think? I am excited that Denise's returning. I just hope he takes a lot of liberties with the next story. Maybe you will, maybe you won't. What do you guys think? Jump into the comments below and let us know your thoughts. All right, guys. With that down, let's move on to this. You know, it's not often that our final main story of the day would be about a poster. I, I don't know that I can't remember the last time that's ever happened around here, but man, we got to talk about this one because later in the day, yesterday, Marvel put out a happy four, four day poster showing off the human torch, which I think gives us, I mean, obviously this is an art style rendition of human torch, yeah. but I do think it gives us a bit of an idea it's about what it's going world like. fair vibe. Now that's not the interesting part of the poster. The interesting part of the poster is on the bottom half of the poster. Here comes the reveal. Of the cityscape behind him. I'm not an architectural student. That is not our earth. That's not our world. That is a, that looks to me like a 1960s idea of a utopia. <laughs> More this kind does. of a thing. Which has, and by the way, let me preface everything we're going to say by saying this. This is just a poster. It could mean a million different things. It doesn't necessarily mean what we're going to talk about right now. We're just saying it could. Because what that image suggests to a lot of people, including myself, is an idea that some people have said right from the beginning. 
This Fantastic Four doesn't happen in the main MCU. By the main MCU, I mean the one that, you know. 616. Yeah, the 616, the one that Steve and Tony did all the, the stuff and all that kind of stuff. Not the one that, uh, you know, she ends up in the other universe with Beast, Hank McCoy, and and whatever. Not not any, but our main MCU. And Rob, if this movie does not take place, at least initially, in our MCU, it explains a couple of things. Number one, one of the questions all of us have asked about a Fantastic Four film is, okay, well, Fantastic, why has nobody ever in the MCU mentioned the Fantastic Four? Even if they were around in the 60s and then disappeared, I mean, that would have been the original superhero team in that world. How, how were they never mentioned? All that kind of stuff. Theoretically speaking, and I think you've brought this up yourself before, Rob, actually, because so Nostradamus here. Some people said that this would explain, if they were from another Rob universe Stradamus. and then maybe end up in ours, <laughs> That would explain that little, you know, um, inconsistency, if that's the case. It also opens up a lot of interesting possibilities. Now, I'm not much of a fan of multiverse, but this could make things work. This could be a mechanism that makes the whole machine run. Anyway, Rob, you saw this poster. What's your first thought on it? Well, I have so many thoughts about this, <laughs> but... Uh, my Rob Stradamus, uh, I will put on my Rob Stradamus hat, and I would say that it makes sense to me that this, the Fantastic Four, come from an alternate, the world of the future today, you know, and maybe, and I don't believe that the Fantastic Four, I think the Fantastic Four are already the Fantastic Four before they get their superpowers. Like, I'd love to see a scene where John F. Kennedy says, you people, you're like the Fantastic Four, you know, and, and somebody lit, and they By the way, that was the best John F. Kennedy impersonation I've ever heard. Just just want to throw that out there. Say, hey, you're the Fantastic Four, right? <laughs> we, do these things. <laughs> we do these things not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Okay, there um, you so, so you, you, so, I, and I, if the Fantastic Four, they blast off into space, and they never come back. You know, they, they disappear. Whatever happens to them, happens to them, and they go on a cosmic odyssey right out of the burn Fantastic Four run in the 80s, which I loved. Because the Fantastic Four were always about, you know, super science, and they've said Galactus is the villain of the movie, but let's say they go into a dystopian future. Like, people were talking about Shala Bali yesterday. I'm like, you know, she was, she is the Empress of Zen Law. She has been in Silver Surfer since issue one. And if you've read, like, I have a, a special edition of Earth X. It, it comes in a plastic machine man thing. It's really cool. I loved Earth X, which is this future where Shalabal is given the power uh, cosmic, I think, by the Franklin Richards iteration of Galactus. If a Fantastic Four wind up on this cosmic odyssey in this unbelievable future, this dystopian, who knows what's going to happen, but it's a very John Byrne, Jack Kirby-esque fantastic odyssey. It makes sense that they might have gone into a future where they meet their unborn child as Galactus, you know, as a celestial. Who knows? Because they're the. That's the way they could get away with doing a Kirby esque kind of a thing. Right. Yeah. And uh, you could you, you could go anywhere. You could have the, the that super science. You are no longer constrained by our world. And I'll tell you something. I think our world. If you look at the Tim story. Fant We've had four bad Fantastic Four movies. If you include the Corman one. If you include yeah. the Corman one. and But I think part of what's hampered the Fantastic Four is they're, they're set in the real world. When I when I saw Fantastic Four, Tim Story's version, the Fox versions, it seemed so mundane. I'm like, they don't belong in New York City. Like, I want to see the New Burn, York City. Kirby, New York City. super science future. You know, I want to see that. And if you give us that, and these posters seem to be saying, this poster in particular is what the World's Fair view, what the Tomorrowland and Disneyland yeah. view of the future is. You give me that Fantastic Four movie, that's closer to what The Incredibles was. You know, The Incredibles, everyone says The Incredibles, the animated, the Pixar movie is kind of right, like right. It's the best Fantastic Four it's movie It's the best Fantastic made. Four yeah. movie. <laughs> and I think a guy like Matt Shackman, after WandaVision and going the direction that Shackman went in by showing us the sitcoms and all that, which was nutty, which was crazy. He's the kind of guy that would pull something like this off. Mm -hmm. And because they got to do, look, James Gunn and Matt Shackman are in the same place. They both have franchises that are on the ropes. They have to do something. This is, this is the re you, you've got 
Wolverine and Deadpool and Wolverine teeing up, but that's the end of the Fox era and the beginning of something else. This movie is the reignition of Marvel. It's mm. that important. And I think just like Superman is the reignition of whatever they're gonna do at DC, this movie is going to establish, and I'll tell you something else, do, going in this direction, I think, is gonna be a banger. I think it's gonna be a banger. If you just had to watch them in the Baxter building in today's New York City, it'd be like, who cares? Who cares? Yeah, I listen, I, I got the main thing for me that has me excited about this is just that it's Matt Shackman doing it. I mean, we've talked about that before. WandaVision, I honestly, in the last five years, I don't think we've had as much engagement on our YouTube channel as much as WandaVision did because people started to joke. Like for the last three months, this has just been the WandaVision channel because whenever we went to live questions, everything was about WandaVision. All the questions was about speculation about the next episode and blah, blah, blah. And something that really Marvel on Disney Plus hasn't been able to replicate since that first one. So seeing him come in here and doing this and maybe they're doing something kind of wild. I don't know. But I think this poster <laughs> brings up some really, really interesting I, possibilities. One, one other thing, John, is that the Marvel Cinematic Universe began. There was a reality to it. Iron Man 1. You go back and watch Iron Man 1. It's very much set in our world. Sure, there's super science. But it's it's in our world. But by the time you get to the end of Endgame, the Marvel Cinematic Universe has become more comic booky with the cosmic nature of the universe. We've seen Xandar. We've seen all this other stuff happening. So when you go back like into the quantum realm, for it seemed goofy. It wasn't cool. It wasn't like they needed to go more Jack Kirby instead of going into this goofiness which mm. is like the, the the cantina in Star Wars. Right. And the tone was wrong. This is going to take where I think the Marvel Universe should have gone after Endgame. Uh, of course, we're, I'm making all this up. It's speculative. Oh, yeah. We, 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 yeah, just be clear. We're speculating. I don't yeah, know absolutely. anything. I don't know anything about this movie other than the fact that I've, I'm excited for it. I can't wait. All right, guys. Question is for you. What do you think about this? I mean, the poster seems to hint that this movie will at least not start in the 616, what is our Marvel Cinematic Universe? Does that open up some possibilities for you? Does it worry you? What, whatever you guys think about this, jump into the comments section below and let us know your thoughts. All right, guys. Now, that's all of our main topics, but we got a bunch of other news that we need to talk about here in other news. But before we do that, and before we get to the stuff in other news, I'm going to remind you guys that next week, I'm going to be broadcasting from Las Vegas because CinemaCon is upon us. I'm super stoked about getting out there. I'm going to be doing daily videos from CinemaCon as I do every single year. But... I've still had a lot of people writing in and asking, what exactly is CinemaCon then? Is it a fan event? Is it a Comic-Con? Whatever. Last year, I put together a quick little explainer about what is CinemaCon, and we thought we would take a few minutes here to kind of run that. So sit back, and this is what CinemaCon is. Check it out. Here on the John Campy Show, you've heard us talking about it for the past few years. The sneak peeks, the early trailers, the exclusive footage, and now we're gearing up to go back. That's right, folks. CinemaCon is right around the corner. But what exactly is this momentous movie event? Why do so many people talk about it? Why don't many people actually go to it? And why do I say it is my favorite event of the year, even over something like Comic-Con? Let's break down what exactly is CinemaCon. At its core, CinemaCon is a convention for those in the movie theatrical business. Theater owners and industry professionals from around the world come to Las Vegas each year to share industry trends, showcase cutting-edge theater technology, screen upcoming films, and rub elbows at what's billed as the largest and most important gathering of movie theater owners in the world. This truly is a global event with professionals from over 80 countries in attendance. CinemaCon was first launched back in 2011 by the National Association of Theater Owners, aka NATO. It emerged from what you used to be called Show West that ran since like the 1970s. Now, since its debut, CinemaCon has become one of the most important events in the film industry. The convention features a variety of keynote sessions, panel discussions, product presentations, and a hell of a lot more. The event brings in people who work in all areas of the motion picture industry. Distribution, marketing, advertising, exhibition, public relations and theater equipment, and concessions manufacturers. The folks who make your movie-going experience what it is. 
for most of the attendees of CinemaCon, the absolute highlight of the event is the studio presentations, which are held in the 4,100-seat Coliseum in Caesars Palace. Almost all of the major studios, Universal, Paramount, Disney, Sony, Warner Brothers, and others, each prepare a one and a half to two and a half hour presentation for the attendees where they talk about their upcoming film slate that year, show off first looks and trailers, and often 10 to 20 full minutes of footage for movies that aren't even coming out for months. The directors and stars of the films are often brought out on stage to dazzle the theater owners, and anywhere from one to four surprise screenings are held showing full movies that are also up to months away from being released in theaters. In just the last two years, Full advanced screenings for films like Top Gun Maverick, The Black Phone, Ghostbusters Afterlife, and several others have been presented. This year, Warner Brothers is showing the new DC movie The Flash, so we're pretty excited about that and the other films that will be screening. The initial reactions to the studio's lineup spark the first bits of excitement in an upcoming movie, and it can play a major role in theaters choosing how many screens that they want to devote to that film. There's a reason why so many movie theaters were showing Top Gun Maverick on so many screens. And I personally say the reason is overwhelmingly because of the positive, the rabid response that the film had at CinemaCon. Yeah, sure, it had been getting standing ovations at things like the Cannes Film Festival, but CinemaCon is where the theater owners are, the decision makers, the people who are choosing how they'll screen a film and how often. CinemaCon also features independent film screenings, special events, and awards ceremonies such as the Big Screen Achievement Awards, which honors outstanding achievements in the movie industry that year. Now, as a channel that's all about movies, it's an extremely important event for us to attend. The major movie studios and production companies are all there showcasing their upcoming slates and allow those of us in attendance first looks at what's on the docket. It's an absolute thrill and privilege to get to share with you guys what we get to see and experience every year for the first time at CinemaCon. Now, CinemaCon is also an expensive event to attend. The week-long event is held at Caesars Palace in Las Vegas, and this year, the cheapest rooms at the hotel are going for over $600 a night. Oh, and then there's the cost of the ticket. One pass to CinemaCon can run you upwards of $1,300 each. And the tickets aren't available to the general public, so it can be a bit tricky getting those passes, although it's not impossible. CinemaCon provides a truly unique venue for industry pros to explore fresh ideas, engage with one another, and stay on top of the latest trends in the global film industry. It helps shape the trajectory of the industry, jumpstarts buzz around box office, and sets the stage for cinematic innovations. That's why I always cannot wait to get back and see what the con has in store for us each year. Thanks so much for watching this, guys. We hope that this video clarified a little bit about what CinemaCon is. If you still have questions, feel free to jump down to the comments below and let us know there. So until next time, my friends, bye-bye. So that's what we've got coming up. That's CinemaCon, guys. And uh, I'm so, I, it's, it's my favorite event to go to every year. Uh, I can't wait to get back out there. We're leaving on Sunday to go out. So. And we're going to do videos there on Sunday as well, so keep up with us for all the stuff that we're going to get out of Sunday. All right. That down, guys. There's a bunch of other things going on in the world. Oh, I, I guess my mic had been turned off. We're a whole bunch of stuff going on in the world of movie news, guys. So let's see what is in other news. Jonathan, what do we got up? All right. So first up, Maggie Gyllenhaal's upcoming directorial effort, a Frankenstein-inspired new film called The Bride, just released their first look at Christian Bale and his role. The film is set in the 1930s and will also star Jesse Buckley, Penelope Cruz, Peter Sarsgaard, and Annette Bening. Rob, buy or sell the first look at Bale in The Bride? Well, aside from a little bit of a Joker vibe, uh, I, I buy it. I can't wait. I love Maggie Gyllenhaal forever because of Secretary yeah. but, um, and James Spader. But look at this. I mean, who doesn't want to see this? I don't know what this is about other than the fact that uh, usually it's the bride of Frankenstein. This looks like Frankenstein. I'm in. Count me in. Yeah, I'm I'm going to buy it, but only by a little bit. I mean, we just had Poor Things. I know. Which was another take on the Frankenstein kind of tale. But listen, this stack is cues, uh, is, is is packed. Uh, uh, Penelope Cruz, Peter Skarsgård, Annette Benning. I mean, it, it looks, and it's Christian Bale. So yeah, I'm, I'm going to say buy a little bit. I'm going to buy it. All right, what's next? 
Okay, next up. A TV series set in the world of Legally Blonde is in development at Amazon Prime Video. Variety has confirmed. No plot details are available, but the project is being executive produced by Reese Witherspoon. Mark Platt, a producer of the films, will also executive produce. Amazon MGM Studios will produce the series. John Byer sell a Legally Blonde series. I sell it. I get it. A lot of people love Legally Blonde. This is, but there are some films out there that a lot of people seem to love that I don't get the love for it. And I've never really gotten the love for Legally Blonde. I love Reese Witherspoon. I think she's incredible. But this is not one. So I got no interest in them doing a TV series on it myself personally. So for me, it's a sell. Rob? You have no heart. I buy it. <laughs> Bring on Elle Woods. I mean, I would love to see a story. I mean, make the, make the Legally Blonde movie about Elle Woods today. And her dog. And her dog. Come on. <laughs> All right. What's next? Okay. Apparently, the price is not wrong, Bob. According to Drew Barrymore, a Happy Gilmore 2 is in the works, as she got confirmation directly from Adam Sandler. On her show, Barrymore looked at her phone to seemingly confirm that Happy Gilmore 2 is in the works. This just in, I have breaking news, she says. I'll just say this, from my source, that it is in process. John, buy or sell a Happy Gilmore 2. I'm going to buy it. And look, you can all, you can totally ask the question. I know people are going to ask it. Do we need a Happy Gilmore 2? No movie has ever been needed. But especially when it comes to comedies, it's not so much the continuation of the story. It's wanting to revisit these characters and see what they do. And Happy Gilmore is just so funny. And what's what's the one guy that says Shooter McGavin? Mm -hmm. That is, You got to get Shooter McGavin back. Oh, yeah. I mean, you have to have Shooter back in there. Um, so listen, yeah, I, I'm down for this. I buy it, Rob. Buy it. Come on. I love Happy Gilmore. It's one of Adam Sandler's best movies. Come on. It's a golf movie. I grew up in, in my family. The religion was golf. So Happy Gilmore, Caddyshack. There's not enough golf movies in the world. Tin Cup. Bring Only it up. Two sad things. Bob Barker can't be there. Mm -hmm. I know. And uh, Carl Weathers can't be there. Right. Uh, that's unfortunate. All right. What's next? Okay. Next now I'm up. bummed out. Yeah. According to The Hollywood Reporter, Netflix's Avatar The Last Airbender is getting their third set of showrunners before season two has even gone into production. Albert Kim, who replaced creators Michael Dante DiMartino and Brian Konietzko, is heading over or handing over the series to colleagues Christine Boylan and Jabbar Raizani. John Byers sell Avatar going on to its third new showrunner team. I sell it. Um, I actually, I, I finally finished Avatar The Last Airbender and I enjoyed it. I didn't think it was like awesome, but I thought it was pretty good actually. Yep. And the guy get, did, get, did a good job. Now listen, I understand he's been on this series. The guy, the showrunner has been on the series and running it for four years now. And he's ready to move on and do other things. I get that. And I respect that, but kind of like in sports, sometimes you need some consistency you need some stability they've just finished their first season and they're already going on to their third set of showrunners so listen it might turn out great and everything but for now i gotta sell it rob what about you I, i'm with you this kind of turnover is never a good thing at the create the highest levels of creation of a tv show it's not good all right what's next all right and finally up after it was announced yesterday that Three time. Three time. time. Emmy winner Julia Garner would be playing the Shalabal version of the Silver Surfer in the upcoming Fantastic Four movie. Actor Lakeith Stanfeld took to social media and hinted he was up for the role by saying, I thought it was going to be me. Which would suggest that Marvel at one point may have been considering using the Norrin Rad version of Silver Surfer instead. Rob, buy or sell Lakeith Stanfeld playing Silver Surfer if Marvel had gone with Nor Nor Norrin Rad version of the character. Uh, I don't understand why people think Norrin Rad isn't going to be in this movie. No one said that. I mean, you know, so we know. I, I, I buy it. I buy it. Um, listen, if they if they had gone with a Norrin Rad version of it, and we may still see that character, because again, according to that poster we talked about a little bit about, this isn't even our MCU that this is going to be taking place in, at least at first, so who knows. But listen, Lakeith is amazing. He is. I mean, and I'm not even just talking about him in Atlanta or um, uh, uh, Glass, uh, Knives Out, I mean. I mm -hmm. almost said Glass Onion. Knives Out. and what, He's just a phenomenal performer. And so had they gone that way, I would have been totally down for him playing again. I, I like his voice, too. Oh, he's got, listen, if you just even look at his character 
in, say, what was the one Wasn't he, he did? Wasn't he in The Haunted Mansion? The, he the, was the, also in The yeah, Haunted yeah, Mansion. Yeah. Yeah. What was the one he did with uh, Daniel Kaluuya? Um, get, no, that got some Oscar nominations. Get out! No. Oh, the last no, no, no. last man. No, not San Francisco. Oh um, no, 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 no! no, no, no. The, the one I'm, around uh, the um. Uh, oh, I'm trying to remember the name of it. I know. I talked. Anyway, it's if on you tip look at him in those two, in Glass Onion and well, they were Get Out, because he wasn't Get Out. Uh, yeah, well, he was great in they Get Out as well, it. but that's not the one I see. The uh, one he did with Daniel Kaluuya. Uh, that got some Oscar attention. Oh, 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 uh, Judas that, and the Black Messiah. Yeah, 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 yeah that's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If yeah. you take his character from that and Glass Onion and kind of merge them, you could to totally hear a Silver Surfer voice. Yeah, yeah. I think a little bit. So yeah, that's why I would have. Yeah, you would. Done it but that that, there's no, you know, what's interesting is is if this isn't a different universe, it makes sense that something different would happen. Yes. So we'll see. All right, guys. With that all down, we're now going to move on to the most important part of our show, which is taking your live comments and questions. What do you guys have to say? Now, before we do, we're going to take a quick second and thank the sponsor of today's episode of the John Campus Show podcast, my mobile service provider, and they should be yours, Mint Mobile. Guys, we want to take a moment to thank a sponsor of today's video, Mint Mobile. After years of fine print contracts and getting ripped off by overpriced wireless providers, if we've learned anything, it's that there's always a catch. So when I heard that for a limited time, all Mint Mobile wireless plans are $15 a month when you purchase a three-month plan, I thought, what's the catch? But after talking to them, it all made sense. There isn't one. Mint Mobile's secret sauce is that they sell wireless services online. They cut out the cost of retail stores and pass those sweet savings on to you. And guys, you know, ever since... Since I switched over to Mint Mobile, I am spending less than one third on my wireless bills than I used to with one of the major carriers. So say goodbye to your overpriced wireless plans, jaw-dropping monthly bills and unexpected overages. All plans come with high-speed data and unlimited talk and text delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. Use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and bring your phone number along with your existing contacts. So guys, to get this new customer offer and your new three-month unlimited wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month, go to mintmobile.com slash campia that's mintmobile.com slash campia cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash campia 45 dollars upfront payment required equivalent to 15 dollars a month new customers on first three month plan only speed slower above 40 gigabytes on unlimited plan additional taxes fees and restrictions may apply see mint mobile for details and thank you to our friends at mint mobile for sponsoring today's episode of the john campia show podcast all right, guys, that down. Let's get over to your question, shall we, here? Jonathan, what we got up first? First up, we got Chef Rigo. Chef, Chef Rigo! Rigo. <laughs> um, just want to give a happy birthday shout-out to my friend Natalie. Deep down, she's a fan of the show, whether she wants to admit it or not. That's true of everybody. <laughs> everybody knows it. Everybody fucking loves this Let's show. Admit it, Natalie. People who <laughs> yes, haven't even found on, it yet Natalie. love it. Admit that. Get with the program. All right, what's Nothing next? to be embarrassed about. <laughs> Sanchez guy says, hey, guys, since you know PBS, uh, if you heard of PBS science show Nova, mm -hmm. this show is now in its 50th anniversary. That's crazy. Really? I grew up watching Nova. Yeah, yeah. I, we had see in Canada, we had two big science things. We had Nova was up there. I mean, it's not a, it's not a Canadian show, but it, we had that up there and we had David Suzuki. That's who we had in Canada. Dr. David Suzuki. That was our main science stuff at the time. 50 years. Woo. All right. What's next? Uh, Mega Red says, greetings from Seattle. My hometown. Starting the weekend with a joint a joint in the JCS. Help me decide. <laughs> Go out to see Monkey Man or stay in and watch Three Days of the Condor in honor of Winter Soldier 10th anniversary. That's right. We were talking about it a little bit yesterday. That's Winter Soldier's 10th anniversary. That I got to say, uh, Three Days of the Condor, man, it's got a great... I love that movie. Yeah, I recently rewatched it. What again, a great ending. I didn't love Monkey Man. But I liked it. Like, in a thumbs up or thumbs down, I'm a thumbs up for Monkey Man. I would say go see it because it's really interesting. The action is top notch. Uh, I definitely think it's worth going to check out. And then you can always come back and watch Three Days at the Condor. All right, what's next? Uh, Raymond Verada, Verada says, according to Variety, James Cameron is planning to remake Fantastic Voyage. We're still waiting for the next Avatars. Will we still be alive? I, I, I hate to say Will it. He? I don't think he's still going to be alive. Yeah, it's more likely. I mean, they've been talking about this for decades, yeah. literally. Well, remember how long he talked about Alita Battle Angel before yeah. it ever happened? I mean, it was literally well over a decade. He's got four Avatar movies to get done. Right. It, or, or is it three more? I can't remember. Does the total four? Five. I, let's say I think three five. more. Yeah, three more. So it's going to end up being four in total? Four? Anyway. And, <laughs> like, we haven't even got the second one yet. Or the the, um, the third, third one yet. So I... 
I doubt it's ever going to happen. I I don't think so, but uh, you never know. Hey, listen, never bet against the good Jimmy Canadian C. kid, <laughs> James C. Never, ever bet against him. <laughs> Jay All right, Cammy. what's next? I see you, Jimmy C. <laughs> I see you. Uh, Ryan Gerger says, I said, Jay Cammy. Uh, what if Slumdog Millionaire and Lion came out the same year? Uh, who would win Best Picture at the Oscars? Which one was Lion? Yeah, I'm not. Is that I'm the not... one where he's adopted by? Yes, uh, the other. The Dev... are, are we talking about? Dev... Yeah, yeah, Dev Patel. Dev Patel. Is that, yeah, Lion. Is Nicole Kidman? Is that? No, no. Who was it that kind of is a, is a, like the adoptive? Figure? Look that up, Ray, for yeah, me, yeah. would you? I believe you're t- what the what you're talking is, about. Is, is what correct. I just said. Yeah. yeah, is that the right one? Uh, um, Slumdog yeah, Millionaire. Yeah, Nicole Kidman. Yeah, it is Nicole Kidman. All right. Uh, Slumdog Millionaire. Yeah, 100%. It's, it's it's such a great movie. Danny Boyle did that one. Try right? home, man. Uh, oh, the, the music in that movie is so good. It's so good. So, yeah, I would go with that one. All right. What's next? I believe Amin is next. Uh, I know you don't want them to do Dune Messiah, but if anyone can do it, it is Denis. Trust in a fellow Canadian, John. He has yet to make a bad film. It's true. He's yet to make a bad film. Um, I trust him to change Dune Messiah. Like, I, I don't think you can take Dune Messiah as it is and make it a good movie. The narrative. I, I think but you can. <laughs> I can trust that he can adapt it and adapt the hell out of it into a good movie. Into a I, musical. <laughs> into a musical. <laughs> That'd be awesome. <laughs> no, it wouldn't. <laughs> yes, it would. I want it. Now I want it. It's got to be, it's like 15 musical numbers of remixed 80s hits <laughs> in Dune 3. <laughs> Can you imagine the sandworms? Would that be, out? would that? Sandworms oh. doing jazz hands. Stan, would that, would that be Dune 3, Fale e Dune? Oh. Yeah, Fale e Dune. Oh. Fale a nude, as <laughs> Ray put it. All right, what's next? <laughs> All right. Uh, Dildar, the glorious. The glorious. Sorry for causing a big rant yesterday. I wasn't expecting so many people to be upset over what I said. I feel terrible about it. I don't even remember. I'd have to remember said. what you said. Yep, but I uh, wasn't here. <laughs> apology accepted, Captain Nita. As long as you're speaking the truth and that's how you feel, it's not, you know, who cares? You know, who cares? Yeah. All right. I also, I don't think we were, yeah. What's next? Ryan Gerger says, two weeks ago, I finished Three Body Problem. I think it's a better show than Foundation. What do you think, John and crew? I don't think it's a better show than Foundation, but I really liked it. Um, there are some things, I, I think there are a couple of logic problems narratively, not in the science, but I think there's a couple of logic problems narratively um, with it. But I I was, listen, I, I told you guys the story. I decided to, it was about 9.30 and I thought, oh, I'll watch the first episode of Three Hour Problem. 6 a.m. rolls around and I finished the last episode. Did I, you do I, did, that I with couldn't Foundation, stop Foundation though? Well, no, because well, I watched one. Started, it came out one stop? episode at a time. Oh, okay, okay. Because Netflix just drops it all at once. Because that says something about a show where you're like, I'm going to watch one episode, and you end up watching the whole thing. I did that with Breaking Bad. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna lie here. I actually called off the next day because I went through <laughs> come. all of Breaking Bad. <laughs> I'm not calling in sick. I'm calling in Breaking Bad. Um, but People did that I, I do think too. Foundation is the better show i think it's the better story i think it has the more interesting characters all that kind of stuff but that's not a slam on three body problem because i really liked it i do i do think that three body problem is a better book adaptation than foundation is in terms of adapting the source material Mm. and and the american call it the american version of three body problem i'm going to do a show about this today later uh, I think what they've done is actually made the book more palatable to general audiences, mm. which I think is a really a, quite a feat. You know, I was listening to a little bit of the official podcast with Benioff and Weiss uh, on it, and they're talking to them about it. And that's one of the things they talked about was taking some of the concepts in the book and making them more, what's the word? Not Not dumbing it down, but it's like... Telling it in a language that's better understood by everybody. Yeah, and I thought I, they did a really good job. I mean, they, they're, the characters in Three Body Problems, some of them, you, you couldn't adapt it directly. It just doesn't. You have to take liberties. And I think they did a really great job doing that. All right. What's next? Suthia says, seems like most prevalent phrase of the week amongst reactors is, are you kidding me? Well, uh, it comes to the arrogant foolishness of one Nagakato. Nagakato. Is that the name of Toronaga's son? In what? Oh, Look, I, I don't want to give it away for anybody who hasn't seen it. But somebody wrote in on yesterday's show. I guess he should have worn shoes. <laughs> um, that, I... When don't show, spoil it. 
makes me go, oh my God. <laughs> it like that's a powerful thing when a show at the end of an episode makes you, oh my God. And at least four of the episodes of Shogun have done that for me. And like I cannot wait for next week's episode. What do we got? Two or three left. I think three. Was that episode seven? Yeah, yeah. So there's three left. I uh, I mean, oh my God. <laughs> it's like ah uh, worn shoes. Yeah, should have worn shoes. There must be dog poop in there. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's exactly it. Steps and dog poop. That's what it was. Oh, that's nuts. nasty. Nasty. I'll All right, what's cut next? My foot off if I ever stepped it. <laughs> Jamie Rell. The episode of Suits when you're stoned and Mike's dealing with loss and Harvey brings up his dad is a nice bonding episode. Also, cru- screw Hardman. You know what? It, I am like many people that I did not discover Suits until long after it was off the air. And, but I did get on board with it before it became the number one streaming show in yeah, the world. Yeah. Because Anne started watching it. I'm like, oh, okay, so I'll watch this. And I guess I was doing that just as a lot of other people were doing it too. And then it became the absolute number one stream television show of the year years after it had been canceled. Like, it's just so crazy. that I like, discovered watching that clip when he first comes in and says, I want to be a lawyer. Right. You know, because he, he his memory, he knows the bar book by heart. I, I didn't even I, know what it was from. You know what the first clip I saw was him... Somebody told me the basic idea of, okay, it's this guy who's not really a lawyer, joins a law firm, but he's got like a photographic memory. I'm like, all right. And the first clip somebody showed me was Mike in court. And um, somebody suggested to him, you don't even care about your client. He says, your honor, pick any page in that report. She goes, page 219. 219 is about Michael Jemerson and his family who went down with this and checked into the hospital. I'm like, all right, I want to watch this show now. And like <laughs> the characters are so good. And it's crazy now that you see them on every commercial now. Characters from from uh, Suits in every single commercial, like seven years after the show finishes run. It's like so insane. And one of the actors is now royalty. And that's right. <laughs> Meghan and Mark, sort of royalty. Like they're not really in the royal family. Oh, that's right. They've been demonetized. Yeah, Meghan Markle's in there. <laughs> demonetized. <been> demonetized. <laughs> All right, what's next? All right, we got Jared Oberfeld who says, over under 50% Disney debuts the Moana 2 trailer next week. Also, it does not matter if the Silver Surfer is a dude. If the story sucks, the movie sucks. It, he was played by Lawrence Fishburne and Doug Jones, and that movie sucks. <laughs> well, I mean, like, my whole point about it, and, and you know what's so funny? When you get some comments that are clearly being made by people who comment. By the way, there's a few things you can do online to make yourself look dumber than commenting on something before you watch it. Right, right. There's very few things you can do to make yourself look more stupid. And I'd have a couple of people who run and said, well, you know, uh, just because uh, Silver Surfer was in the bad one doesn't mean the Silver Surfer was bad. I specifically said on the show, they did a, a Fantastic Four movie with the rad traditional Silver Surfer and that movie sucked. Obviously, the movie didn't suck because they had yeah. that Silver Surfer. It just proves the point, though, that having that Silver Surfer is not going to be the make-or-break thing. Like, it, that didn't make a bad movie a good movie. Therefore, having a different version of the Silver Surfer who is directly from the comics is not going to be the make-or-break in this one either. It, that, that's that's the only point I was making. Now, to your thing about Moana, doesn't it come out, didn't they say it comes out in December, Moana 2? I think so. Can I don't you know. can you look Holly's that up for me, Ray? The November, release date maybe? for Moana too, because I thought they said it comes out around Christmas time. Is it is it December? It's not. I, I, Just look at Moana two release date. Yeah, it's pulling up right now. Sorry. So uh, November twenty seventh. November. Okay. So in in at CinemaCon next we're in April. So May, June, July, August, September, October, November. We're still eight months away from it. So I doubt. Now I do think they'll show us some footage. I think Disney's got a long presentation window. They got like a two and a half hour presentation window. So I think we're going to get a whole ton of Deadpool footage. I think we're going to get a lot of uh, Moana footage. Nelson Peltz. (laughs) You know what they might show? What's that? Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes. I sure hope they do. That's May 10th. Yeah, I know. Yep. I mean, at minimum, they're going to show us probably 20 minutes of it, but they might show the whole damn movie. I hope, I certainly hope they do. Fingers crossed. All right, what's next? Okay, and also that was a $20 super chat. Oh, thank you, Jared. Appreciate that, man. Uh, David Mata says, 
Hey crew, hi Chris, it's Rob today. On Monday, me and my girls did a double feature. We saw Dune Part 2, uh, the best picture of the year, and the hilarious late night with the devil. Hilarious. Yeah. Thanks, and bring on the filthy. You know, I still haven't seen Late Night with the Devil. You gotta see it, dude. I watched, I watched like a seven minute featurette on it, but funny? Because they just made it look like a straight up horror in the thing it's, that I saw, it, but is it actually funny? Um, It has humorous elements, certainly. <laughs> I wouldn't call it the feel good comedy of the year though. But you you really like that. I love it. I've seen it twice. All right, I got to see that. I loved it. All right, what's next? Uh one second. We scroll down. I got to find where we left off. It bumped on me. Um yeah, yeah, okay. Demaris Love, Olivia and Margot would have to be uh would have a better time doing an Angela movie. That way they can continue with Thor and introduce the 10th realm uh heaven or even or am I reaching with that idea? Angela. Angela. Um, no. I, I like whenever somebody picks a project, you know, well, they should have done this pro. I mean, yeah, you could have done that, but I think if they pick this is because they have an idea and it's right. because something that they want to do. And listen, while I'm not a huge fan of Don't Worry Darling, Olivia Wilde showed that she's pretty good in the director's chair. Yeah. And so I'm going to get Simon Kimberg, as long as he's not directing, is obviously got a huge pedigree and resume when it comes to the comic book genre. Margot Robbie's production company, Lucky Chap, is kind of like ruling the world right now. So I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. All right, what's next? All right, next up we got uh, White Strong and Sugar and Two Sugars, please. I think Deadpool is going to create a new Earth in the MCU. We will move from 616, uh, and the film will rewrite story. and We'll start following Earth 999. Rob? I like that idea. <laughs> um, I, I, you know, I don't, I don't know, though, because here's the thing. I think that kind of a, that massive change puts too much emphasis on Deadpool, I think. But you never know, because, look... Although maybe that's what they need to do. Does that mean it's going to be mutant centric all of a sudden? Because we still don't know who's in the Avengers. <laughs> I all have right. No idea. What's next? All right. Uh, White Strong and Two Sugars Please is back and says, uh, I saw Late Night with the Devil last night, eight out of 10. More into backstory of the woods and characters was needed, though. Thanks for the recommendation. Well, I don't, maybe, but I, I mean, the whole point is that you're you're watching a talk show. You know, and you're watching, it's done like a found footage movie. Like you're watching something that actually happened. So I, you know, I think it worked really well. This looks good, actually. All right, what's next? All right, we got Kaiser Soze. If <laughs> F4 is not in the main universe, a female server surfer makes a lot of sense because we can get the traditional main universe. Yeah, and again, it needs to be emphasized to people who didn't get the memo because I got a lot of these comments too. They did not gender swap Silver Surfer. Yeah, that's this is a character from the comic books. Right, right. It's not the one that's more well known, granted, but it's a, it's a character directly from the comic books. Yeah, right, from Silver next? Surfer number one. From Silver Surfer number one. All right, what's next? Uh, we get a man who says, "With all the kaiju talk lately, my favorite is still Cloverfield by Matt Reeves." Oh, thank you. Uh, with runtime <laughs> of an hour and twenty-five minutes, the perfect Ray runtime. I am in the minority. Damn. I don't. I don't like Cloverfield. What? I much preferred Cloverfield Lane. Um, I actually, yeah, I I didn't find the first Cloverfield movie very interesting at all, to be honest with you. But I know most people love it. You know, it. it holds up, though. You should give it another watch. I watched it recently. It's pretty good. I'd loan you my disc if you want. <laughs> all right. What's next? Use your eyes next time. Uh, Use your uh, eyes, not your butthole. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's see. Matan says, what power Jared Leto has that he is starring in Tron Ares? He is a bad person that the public hates after Morbius. Unless that was a Sean Bailey decision, as he did have bad taste. Well, it's not up to him. It's up to the casting directors. Nobody hates him, right? Jared Leto's an Academy Award-winning actor. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, just because you're he's in a movie that pe people didn't like the movie, I mean, Robert De Niro's been in bad movies. Plus, he's got 30 Seconds to Mars. Movies. I, I mean, like, yeah, anyway, that's a ridiculous Come on, Jared Leto's in Fight Club. All right, what's next? All right. Amin says, Ray, we need a buy and sell emoji so we can participate. Oh, oh that's, well, that's a just, very I mean, good idea. idea. From now on, yeah. Just block him. 
Yeah. <laughs> we don't need any more work. Any more. <laughs> but to be fair, they do have the thumbs up and thumbs down emoji they could just use. But still, a buy and sell, that's actually a pretty good idea. Yeah, that's a really, good. really good idea. Send them to me when you're done. Yeah. All right, what's next? <laughs> Juliana Goodwin says, maybe it's because I saw Poor Things three different times, but I really want Yargos Lanthimos to do a Cabinet of Dr. Caligari remake. What about you guys? I mean, that that would fit. Yeah, again, I... The look, anyway. When I kind of recoil a bit when a director does a certain movie that because there's similarities with another kind of story that they should also direct that, right? And it happened a lot when Peter Jackson, when The Lord of the Rings was out and Peter Jackson with Hall, everybody thought he should direct every kind of sword and sandal or fantasy film. And so, I mean, like, yes, that would be fine, but I don't feel a particular need for it though. That's just me. I agree. All right, what's next? Okay, Matan is back and says, also a clarification, what I said on yesterday, the doubling down on remakes is doing uh, a Moana one, especially now that the remakes are straggling. I, you have to look at every individual movie on its own individual basis. And I think Moana can be a hit. I'm, I'm not necessarily saying it's going to be like, um, Aladdin level $1 billion hit, but it, I think it's going to be a hit, especially when you consider that Moana again, last year, even though the movie's what, seven years old, it was the number one streamed movie across all platforms of the year. That's crazy. Yeah, this thing's going to make a lot of money. Yeah. All right, what's next? Oh, uh, then we got Raymond who says, uh, thoughts on Tales of the Empire trailer? Boring. As soon as I found out it was just shorts, I was honestly just instantly bored by it. But it looked pretty cool, though. Yeah, it looked cool until I found out it's multiple stories they're doing, and then it's just another thing of shorts. Do you know what, though? Didn't, it, I'm not interested. I, I, I wish that they would just have the Sith win. I'm so bored of all the other, all the characters, all the heroes in the Star Wars universe. I want them all to lose. I want the First Order, the Empire, whatever. And when I was watching that, 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 the, the, what is it, Tales of the Empire, I'm looking at this going, or Tales of the Sith. I'm like, I like this. I'm more interested in this. I'm tired of being bored to tears by Star Wars. I want the Sith to win. I want the Acolyte to come and take over. I want red lightsabers and every other color gone. I want death, destruction, and the Sith to rise. You might be a Sith, All right. yes, Rob. Kids. What's might, next? Might be a Sith. Uh, Imposter says, "Hey, John, I've been watching the show for years now. I was wondering if you watched Invincible season two, <laughs> <laughs> and what your initial thoughts." I've been asked this question about oh, five hundred. Are you, you sure you've been ordered. watching for four years? I've I've talked about this a lot. Um, again, uh, saw cornered. the first half of season two. Didn't love it. Uh, it was okay. And, but it really kind of took away a lot of my enthusiasm, so I've not watched the second half of season two yet. I, I will get around and watch it at some point, but I haven't watched the second half of season two yet. All right, and is that it for the Super Chats? Supers, yes. Then that's, guys, we, we're being told that our stream is really bad right now, so we're just going to end the show today on that note. Thank you so much for being here and making today's show part of your day. Big special thank you to all you guys who sent in those questions. Number one, because he gave us fun things to talk about. Number two, you supported our channel as you did it, and all of us involved with the show, thank you guys so very much for your support. I want to thank the people in the room with me, Ray Ora. Have a good weekend, everyone. Jonathan Voiko. Hello and goodbye. Writer, director, producer, Robert Meyer Burnett. I can't wait to see the Empress of Zen Law. <laughs> my name's John Campia, and until next time, my friends, bye-bye.